Film photography can be somewhat daunting to jump into, but today I'll be giving you five complete steps to getting started. Before we get started though, I would like to say there will be a glossary of all like the photography terms that I uh, use in this video. So if you don't understand something, feel free to check down there and uh, you know, make sure you, you understand what's going on. Also, if you feel overwhelmed or confused on the first watching this video, that's all right. Photography is definitely a learning curve and you have hopefully got a lot of years ahead of you where you can you know, really learn stuff and really, really get it down. So don't be too concerned if you don't quite get everything from the get-go. All right, so you obviously need a camera and lens before you can take any kind of picture. There are a few different kinds of film cameras. There are SLRs, rangefinders, and point and shoots. As a beginner, you'll probably wanna go with an SLR. They're simple to operate, but they allow enough control that you'll be able to experiment and gain a good understanding of photography. You can tell SLRs apart from other types of cameras by first, the little hump that's on the top of the camera with an eyepiece at the back. And second, if you take off the lens, there will be a, a mirror at a 45 degree angle and that, that's how you know it is an SLR camera. You can find these cameras at thrift stores, on eBay, or you might honestly have a relative that just has one lying around from, from when they were younger. They were built like tanks, so if it looks like it's in good shape, it probably still works. Any camera from your standard mid-range brands will definitely do the job, and those are Canon, Minolta, Olympus, Nikon, and Pentax. Now let's talk about lenses. There are two types of lenses. There are prime lenses and there are zoom lenses. As one might expect, zoom lenses are lenses that you can zoom in and out. And prime lenses are lenses that are fixed at one focal length. The focal length of a lens, or, or how zoomed in a lens is, is denoted by a millimeter value. So for instance, your standard phone camera most likely has an equivalent of a 28 millimeter lens on it. And your telephoto lens or your, your portrait lens will most likely have a, a 50 millimeter equivalent. A lot of old film cameras will come with a 50 millimeter prime lens attached, which is honestly perfect for beginners. 50 millimeter lenses are normally really well made and easy to come by, and they've got some other advantages that we'll talk about in just a second. If your camera didn't come with a lens, I would honestly just recommend getting a 50 millimeter lens with a compatible lens mount. If you don't know what lens mount your camera is, you can actually just go to Google and search your camera and then just type in lens mount and you'll be able to figure out what that is. Well, looking at a lens, you might notice the little number next to the millimeter that starts with an F and might be you know F 2.8 or F 1.4. This value is known as the aperture or the f-stop and it denotes how much light a lens is capable of gathering. You'll see values of anywhere from f1.2 to f4 on standard prime lenses, and the lower the number is, the more light it can gather, which is a good thing, especially with film. 50 millimeter lenses are great because they oftentimes have pretty low aperture numbers, which means they can gather lots of light, which is really great and really useful. So they're definitely a, a recommended first buy. I would get one with an aperture of anywhere in between f1.4 and f2, and you should be Good to go. So now you've got your camera and your lens, but what about film? Like everything else, there are a lot of film stock options out there. There's actually three types of film. There is first color negative film, and there's color positive film, and there's black and white film. As a beginner, you'll probably just wanna stick with color negative film. It's really lenient in terms of exposure. It's easy to work with, and obviously it, it gives really beautiful colors, you know, the, the, the classic film look. But even within color negative film, there is a lot of different options for specific looks and specific films. I would recommend you start with Kodak Gold 200. It is a kind of budget to mid-range film that gets pretty good bang for your buck. The 200 means it is ISO 200, and what that means is ISO is essentially how sensitive your film is to light. So ISO 200 is kind of middle of the road in terms of sensitivity. Say if you wanted to do a lot of shooting kind of at night or in darker spaces, you'd probably want ISO 800 film rather than 200 because that'll give you a little bit more light or at least a little bit more light sensitivity. But for general use, ISO 200 is, is sufficient as long as you know you're using it mostly outdoors in, in good lighting. So now you've got everything together and it's time to shoot. So in a slightly darker space, you'll actually want to put your film into your camera. So this can vary from camera to camera, but in most cases, what you're gonna do is you're gonna pull up the film rewind lever and kind of pop this open here. And this camera makes it really easy. You kind of just pop your film in. Make sure the taper comes down like this. That is the proper way your film's supposed to be in there. And what makes this camera really easy is you can actually just kind of close this film door and make sure this film's proper, properly aligned here. And then, with a little bit of luck, it'll just come over like that. And you can see it's taut now, so that means it is ready to go. So I can close it up here. And then advance the film to the zero position. 
and I am ready to shoot. And one more thing you also wanna keep an eye out on is you wanna make sure that your ISO is set to the proper value. Now this doesn't actually change anything about the film. This is purely for your meter, which we will talk about in more depth later, but make sure that this little number, right, that, that little number right there in green is set to the proper value. So in this case, ISO 200. So before you start taking pictures, it's definitely a good idea to kind of learn how to make a proper exposure. If you've got a camera that came out anywhere from, you know, really 1980 on, it probably has a lot of automatic features and you can put a lot of things into auto, but it's still a really good idea just to know how everything works. Once you've gotten your film inserted and your ISO set properly, you will have two settings to manipulate the brightness of an exposure. The first is aperture, which we talked about earlier. And again, that is just how much light your lens can let in. So this lens has a maximum aperture of f1.4, which is a lot of light. But say I was outside and maybe it was really sunny and I, I you know, had enough light, I would actually turn that aperture down or, or close the aperture down to maybe an f8 or, or something along those lines to, to kind of rein in that exposure and make sure I'm not getting too much light into my camera. Now shutter speed. So shutter speed is essentially how long your camera is allowing film to be exposed to light for. You control this with a little dial that is most likely right on top of your camera and say I set it to the 60 value. That would mean that when I took a picture, the camera would allow the film to be exposed for 1 60th of a second. Say I moved it to the two position, that would be one half a second. And likewise, the 500 position would be 1 500th of a second. And essentially the longer your film is exposed to light, the more light it will be gathering. That being said, it can introduce motion blur into your photo, so you wanna be careful about that. Now you can use these in tandem to set the exposure of a picture. And your camera will most likely have some kind of guide to help you get the right exposure. These are called light meters, and it'll give you kind of an idea of how much light is coming in and how much you know you need, what, what you need to set your settings to. This can really vary from camera to camera. My camera specifically that I use the most often, what I do is I set the aperture on my own. I, I kind of just have my own aperture and then it'll tell me an appropriate shutter speed to set. But I would really recommend you look up how to do it for your specific camera, just so you really know how to do it because it, it can vary quite a bit from, from camera to camera. I will give two tips here though. If you are shooting pictures handheld, I would recommend keeping your shutter speed above 1 60th of a second. So like 1 60th, 1 80th, you know, so on and so forth. That'll just make sure the pictures are really steady and you know, you won't have any motion blur from just sh being shaky while taking the picture. And then second, really try to err on the side of having too much light rather than too little light because film is a lot more forgiving when overexposed than underexposed. But now what to do if your camera doesn't have a light meter at all or you know, it doesn't work for whatever reason. There are a couple different ways you can get around this. First, you can honestly just download an app, like a light meter app to your phone and use that. Those can definitely have a learning curve, but they are really useful if you're not really sure what you wanna do. But the second and my personal choice for getting around this is using the Sunny 16 rule. And the way you do this is by setting your shutter speed to whatever is closest to your film ISO. So for instance, Kodak Gold, you'd probably set it to 1 60th of a second or whatever your camera has that's you know close to 200. And then you change your aperture based off of the ambient light that is available. And I'll put up kind of a little diagram or kind of set of rules that are on the screen. I really like Sunny 16. It just is really enjoyable for some reason. And I am planning on doing a video that is a little bit more in depth in the future about that. So keep watching for that. Now deciding what to photograph and when to photograph things can be one of the most difficult parts of photography, especially when you're getting started out. In the beginning, Honestly, you don't have to be too concerned about it all, I think. Really just go out and shoot. But maybe a recommendation would be find somewhere that you think is aesthetically pleasing and go out at, you know, the hour before sunset is a really pretty time for photos. And if you just want to take beautiful photos, that is a, a pretty easy time to do it. And I think it's a great place to start. But obviously, as you kind of progress and as you learn more, you will slowly decide, you know, when when you like to take photos, what you like to take photos of, and, and things along those lines. So I really leave that up to you. Just remember, each roll of film has a maximum of 36 photos, so make them count. I've definitely wasted film on things I definitely didn't need to take pictures of, so keep that in mind. Also, another tip, when I started photography, what I did is I just followed a bunch of photographers on Instagram, and I used their work for inspiration. Sometimes I kind of tried to mimic what they were doing, and that helped me learn a lot. And really get good exposure and then kind of immersed in, in photography, I guess. Now that you've finished your first roll of film, it's time to get it developed. This is pretty standard for most cameras. What you first go and do is you hit this little button on the bottom here, that's the film release button. You kind of get, just click it in. And when you hear the click, then you can go up and open this and just rewind on back. And you'll definitely feel some resistance, but you just rewind 
until you then feel a loss of that resistance. You heard that little click there. And when that resistance seems to be done, and then you can open the camera the same way that you opened it the first time. And you can see I actually left a little bit of slack, just a little bit of film out. That's just my personal preference, but you can kind of bring all of your, your film slack into the canister and that won't be a problem. Most local camera stores will develop and scan film for you and that would probably be the best option, especially starting out. Depending on the scans, you might wanna make some of your own adjustments like white balance or contrast. You can do these in just simple editing apps like Adobe Lightroom Mobile is a good place to start, it's free. So that might be a good place, or you know, really, really any editing app. Film doesn't require a whole lot of editing. I think some, just some basic adjustments here and there to make sure you really nail the look you're going for can be helpful. And you're done. You know, you can post them on Instagram or you know whatever you want to do with your photos. I guess print them out. If you have any more questions, feel free to drop in the comments below, and I'll try my best to answer in a succinct way. Obviously, I like this stuff, so I can talk about it for a long time. I hope this video wasn't too confusing and it really kind of helped demystify film photography a little bit for you. But thanks for watching and I'll see y'all later.